Hello, and welcome to the Chancellor's Lecture Series. I'm Daniel Diemeyer, Chancellor of Vanderbilt University. Today's panel discussion is hosted in partnership with the Vanderbilt School of Medicine Basic Sciences. Two years ago, almost to the day, the World Health Organization designated COVID-19 a global pandemic that would usher in a period of devastating loss of life and persistent upheaval that continues to affect us every day. The pandemic has changed how we work, learn, and communicate at the local level and as a complex global economy. It has made us reconsider our most basic social interactions and has exposed stark inequities and divisions. Perhaps more than ever, it has emphasized the vital need for research and evidence in guiding public health discourse and policy. Since COVID-19 began, Vanderbilt scientists and healthcare providers have been at the forefront of developing solutions to the pandemic. Moreover, some of the world's most prominent treatments and vaccines draw from decades of path-breaking basic science research conducted at Vanderbilt and other leading universities. As a crucial source of past and present knowledge, and as a key driver of innovation, higher education possesses tremendous potential to improve the human condition and move society forward. In the course of the pandemic, we have now reached a turning point. Our vaccines and treatments have created a level of protection against the threat posed by COVID-19, but the virus itself is probably with us to stay. Facing a new reality, we're called to examine the evidence we have gathered and the lessons we have learned since March 2020. Today's panelists reflect a broad range of Vanderbilt's expertise. Their insights and research have better equipped us to persevere and grow together and address future challenges with foresight and rigor. This is the essence of resilience and the spirit of progress. Our program today will be introduced by Professor Larry Manette, who has served as Dean of Vanderbilt University School of Medicine Basic Sciences since its creation in 2016 and has led its dramatic extension as one of the nation's top biomedical research and doctoral programs. I will now turn it over to Dean Monette to introduce our panelists. Thank you to all of our speakers and to everyone for joining us here. Thank you, Chancellor Diermeyer, for the opening remarks and kind introduction. Today, we are pleased to partner our school's Lab to Table conversation series with the Chancellor's Lecture Series. Lab to Table is a monthly event from the School of Medicine Basic Sciences focused on connecting how everyday life is affected and can be informed by biomedical knowledge and discovery and its application. Today, we look to national experts from our Vanderbilt medical community to help us understand what a new normal could look like in our lives in regard to COVID-19. As Dean of the School of Medicine Basic Sciences, I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator and panelists. Our moderator, Dr. Melinda Button, is the Mike Herb Professor and Founding Chair of the Department of Health Policy at Vanderbilt School of Medicine. Before coming to Vanderbilt in 2013, Dr. Bunton was a director in the Health, Retirement, and Long-Term Analysis Division at the Congressional Budget Office. Dr. Bunton's work at Vanderbilt is focused on healthcare delivery and costs with an emphasis on improving the value created by the healthcare system. Dr. Bunton is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and of the National Academy of Social Insurance. Our panelists include doctors Buddy Creech, Consuela Wilkins, and William Schaffner. Dr. Buddy Creech is the director of the Vanderbilt Vaccine Research Program and the Edie Carroll Johnson Chair and Professor in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases in the School of Medicine. Dr. Creech is Principal Investigator of the NIH-funded Vanderbilt Vaccine and Treatment Evaluation Unit. 
and co-principal investigator of the CDC-sponsored Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Network. Dr. Creech's research interests focus on the development and evaluation of new vaccines and therapeutics. He is currently leading COVID-related clinical trials at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center, including the evaluation of novel treatment options for hospitalized patients with COVID and clinical trials of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Dr. Consuela Wilkins is the Senior Vice President and Senior Associate Dean for Health Equity and Inclusive Excellence at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center and a professor of medicine in the Division of Geriatric Medicine. Dr. Wilkins is currently a principal investigator of three NIH-funded centers. The first, the Vanderbilt Miami Meharry Medical Center of Excellence in Precision Medicine and Population Health, which focuses on decreasing disparities among African Americans and Latinos using precision medicine. The second, the Vanderbilt Recruitment Innovation Center, a national center dedicated to enhancing recruitment and retention in clinical trials. And the third, the Vanderbilt Institute for Clinical and Translational Research. She is widely recognized for her pioneering work in stakeholder and community engagement. Dr. William Schaffner is Professor of Preventive Medicine in the Department of Health Policy, as well as Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the Vanderbilt School of Medicine. Dr. Schaffner is the current Medical Director and past President of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases and has served on the Executive Board of the Infectious Disease Society of America. Dr. Schaffner's primary interest has been the prevention of infectious diseases. He has worked extensively on the effective use of vaccines in both pediatric and adult populations and has been a member of numerous expert advisory committees that establish national vaccine policy. Dr. Schaffner is committed to communicating about medicine to the general public and is often invited to comment in local and national media. In fact, Dr. Schaffner has one of the most recognized faces in America over the past two years. I am pleased to turn the conversation over to our moderator, Dr. Button, and our esteemed panelists. Thank you, Dean Marnett and Chancellor Diermeyer for the introductions and those opening remarks. I'm very excited to be moderating this panel and hearing from and chatting with my colleagues since I know this topic is on everyone's mind. So I'm gonna jump in to a first question about definitions. So to get us started, Dr. Schaffner, can you tell us what the difference is between a pandemic and an endemic? So we're starting off using the right vocabulary. Well, just to be clear, Melinda, a pandemic technically refers to a global epidemic. But the way we've been talking about it recently in the United States is how can we trans uh, transfer from this pandemic status to endemic, which means that the disease, the virus is in our population, smoldering along. It's almost as though we had a truce with the virus, a little like something that uh, we have with influenza. Influenza creates an annual epidemic, but we have managed to uh, live with it more or less. So uh, there's uh, beauty is a little bit in the eye of the beholder. Uh, <laughs> The, so uh, you're anticipating all of my questions here, and maybe we'll get familiar and I'll call you Bill too. Um, so, you know, what, what needs to happen for us to reach that endemic state? Well, there are a number of different metrics we could look at. Each of them is imperfect. The proportion of tests that are being done currently, that's positive. We'd like that to be as low as possible, under 10% and even under 5%. If it's higher than that, that suggests that the virus is still spreading very vigorously in our population. Mm -hmm. The number of new cases that are identified and increasingly the CDC is focusing on hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. What are the number of hospitalizations that are occurring and what proportion of hospital beds are currently occupied by people who primarily have COVID disease? That yes. represents the most serious end of the spectrum. 
as, as I like to think of it, Melinda, is uh, if you're on a big plains and looking at a mountain range, you mm -hmm. can tell when the mountain is going up at its top and when it's going down. You don't have to count every tree. After all, <laughs> we don't count every case of influenza, mm -hmm. but we know when we're in the middle of an, a flu outbreak and when it's waning. And so yes. if we and you and your team are tracking that for us every year with the flu. Yeah. So Dr. Creech, what do you want to add to this about when we'll know when we're in that endemic stage? Well, I think one of the most important things that we just talked about was this notion of using other metrics besides simply how many cases mm -hmm. there are, mm -hmm. um, because we all experience those rises and falls in uh, either strep throat or mm -hmm. other respiratory infections that often coincide with winter, being inside a lot, being in crowded conditions. And I, and I think once we get to the point in this pandemic where our healthcare system isn't strained, when we have these increased caseloads, that really is a harbinger of, I think, good things to come. It doesn't necessarily mean we're out of the woods because we certainly see complications of the infection, even when it's seemingly mild at first and when patients haven't been hospitalized. But we even began to see that with the most recent Omicron surge, that despite enormous numbers, our hospitalization rates as a function of how many cases there were, were actually lower. That's a good thing. And that means we're starting to get, I hope, to a different phase of this pandemic. Yes. Although it was my understanding that even though our rates of hospitalization were lower um, on a population basis, some of our hospitals, especially here in Nashville and in Tennessee, were as full as they've ever been. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. When, when you have a small percent of an enormous number, exactly. that's still a lot of people in the hospital. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, you brought up um, what my next question was, was could you tell us a little bit more about COVID-19 variants like Omicron? Sort of where do they come from? Will there be endless variants? It's a good question about whether there will be endless variants. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one truth that we have to sort of lean into here is that the virus is constrained by what it tries to do. And I don't want to over personify the virus, mm -hmm. but it has this spike protein that is the basis for our vaccine. And that's what facilitates it sticking to our cells and getting entry. And so we can only change that spike protein so much before that spike protein is no longer a very good protein for it to stick to our cells. Mm -hmm. So we already have one element of constraint. Okay. The second level of constraint that we have is, is that there are a number of places on the virus that our antibodies and our T cells will recognize principally through vaccination, but also through previous wild type infection. And that combination will also constrain the virus's ability to make endless variants. Okay. However, there is an arms okay. race between us mm -hmm. and the virus so that when we put immunologic pressure, it is going to respond. Mm -hmm. And those populations of viruses that are more adept at avoiding our immunity will begin to emerge if they can grow just as well, if they can stick to our cells just as well. That's mm -hmm. the phase I think that we're in during the pandemic right now is okay. we're in the middle of that arms race Therefore, the more we have vaccinated, the more immunity we have, the more coordinated pressure we put on this virus so that the mutations that do occur actually serve to weaken the virus and push us more towards that common cold side of the spectrum rather mm -hmm. than a severe pneumonia side of the spectrum. Okay. So you, you and Bill have both brought up the flu. And as you talk about this ongoing battle against variants, it starts to sound like the flu vaccine where we're trying to predict every year based on what goes on in the Southern hemisphere, what we'll experience in the Northern hemisphere and, and inoculate people or, or vaccinate people um, to prevent them from getting that strain of the flu. Will COVID-19 vaccines or boosters look like that or will they be different? I don't think we know yet. I think okay. this is still an unknown question because we don't yet know what the durability of immunity is going to look like mm -hmm. in those who have been properly vaccinated, including that third dose that we sometimes call a booster. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in some ways we sacrificed long-term durable immunity to get people maximally immune as quickly as we can. Mm -hmm. um, but as my mentor, Kathy Edwards, likes to say, your immune system is a lot like your mother-in-law. 
it never forgets. And because of that, <laughs> because of that, we know that every time we see mm -hmm. these vaccines, every time we're exposed to the virus, we're laying down a foundation of memory that will serve us better down the road. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we're starting to do in our clinical trials of these vaccines yeah. is to guess and predict where our holes are in mm -hmm. terms of vaccine coverage. Because what we've learned is that despite Delta and despite Omicron, the best approach to provide broad immunity is still through vaccinating with that original strain that the initial vaccines were built off of. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that we might not need variant specific boosters in the future, mm -hmm. but we still get the most bang for the buck when we use those original vaccines. And I think from my standpoint as a vaccinologist, that's really encouraging mm -hmm. that our ancestral vaccine strain is still the one that's going to provide the most broad coverage. And I think we've got to do a good job of responding to the virus mm -hmm. when new variants come along, but also predicting where the holes in our coverage might be. And, and that works ongoing. Yeah. So I want to bring Dr. Wilkins into this. And since she's a geriatrician, um, as, and we're talking about mother-in-laws and all these things, um, how do you see this ongoing pandemic turning into an endemic affecting the elderly? Well, I do think that it's really important for us to think about the populations that have suffered the most mm -hmm. um, during this, this pandemic. And certainly older adults are among those uh, most impacted, but also certainly there are racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic uh, groups that have been disproportionately impacted. Um, I think for it to move to endemic for um, the older adult population will, will be really important um, giving many, many of them have given up so, so much of their lives during the pandemic with restricting their activities to protect themselves and their families. Uh, so shifting to this phase will be really important there. They are having high rates of vaccine uptake. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think uh, being able to, to really reemerge into society in a different way will be important. Um, and, and hopefully for those of them who've lost actually function can regain some of that um, as well. But I think it's been really a difficult time and challenging time for that population, uh, but also for other populations mm -hmm. where we're still struggling to um, you know, recover both socioeconomically as well as health wise uh, from the devastations of, uh, of this pandemic. Yeah. Now, Bill, you were going to jump in and say something. What was on your mind as Betty was talking? Well, Betty was extolling the virtues of our current vaccines, which I mm -hmm. wanted to reinforce. Mm -hmm. But as a friend of ours, a mutual friend of ours likes to say, vaccine left in the refrigerator never pre prevented a single disease. Mm -hmm. And what we have still in our, in, in our state is a problem with under vaccination. Yeah. Uh, folks, uh, the Tennessee volunteers haven't volunteered to the extent that uh, people in many other parts of the country have. Mm -hmm. We still need a lot of people to roll up their sleeves. And as Buddy, the pediatrician, I'm sure will reinforce, that includes children. Yes, yes. Buddy, do you want to add something about children and rates of vaccination there? Well, children have been interesting because early on in the pandemic, um, they certainly seemed less affected by this virus than our older adults and even uh, adults with underlying medical conditions. And in general, our children's hospitals haven't seen the same surge of cases, at least at the same level that our adult colleagues have had. That began to change a little bit with Omicron, where we saw many more children admitted to the hospital with more traditional respiratory illnesses that we ascribe to these respiratory viruses that we see in the winter, like lower wheezing of, in the airways or pneumonia uh, or swelling of the, of the windpipe, the trachea. So mm -hmm. I think we have to be careful about saying that children are unaffected by the virus. They in fact are, mm -hmm. um, maybe their hospitalization rates are less. And so because of that, I think one of our big messages moving forward as vaccines are approved for younger and younger ages is we don't need to sleep on this virus. We need to recognize that it can cause a myriad of complications in even young children. Mm -hmm. And we do well to prevent infections in those children, as well as providing another stopgap measure so that the virus can't gain entry into a family, right? Sometimes it's the six-month-old, the six-year-old that brings the virus into the family, 
of someone whose immune system is compromised, who has an elderly parent or grandparent. So I think it's really, we're all in this together and we all stand to benefit personally and then corporately from vaccination. And, and that's gonna be a real key message for us going forward. Yes. Now, another part of that message um, is about masking. And we're in a state right now where many states and localities either have lifted or are about to lift their indoor mask requirements. So, Bill, you know, w- will masking still be part of our future if there's another surge or variance? How should we think about that? I think in some respects, as I looked at the questions that we might discuss, that might be among the more difficult ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, for sure, the CDC has just issued recommendations such that in many parts of the country, if transmission in that part of the country is low, people can uh, take off their masks when they go indoors into public areas. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not there yet. Uh, But I think there will be places where people uh, will take off their masks. And I was at the supermarket this weekend. I saw many of my fellow citizens uh, kind of ahead of the game, shall Mm -hmm. I say. Uh, Looking forward, uh, I would be inclined to think that there are a lot of very careful people, older folks who are frail, people who have underlying illnesses such as diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, and anyone who's immune compromised. I think we need to be tolerant of them because I think many of those people, having learned about the effectiveness of masks, will continue to wish to use them. And they may use them during flu outbreaks also because Mm -hmm. they've learned that this is comfortable. And uh, now we in the United States have discovered that wearing a mask is not so dorky, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it's more socially acceptable. It's true. And, you know, I we've all known um, that people who've lived in the parts of the world that experienced prior outbreaks of serious viruses like SARS and MERS were more likely to wear masks in public places. So so, buddy, can you talk to us about those other um, those other outbreaks and and whether or not it's likely there will be another virus family that might cause a pandemic or an epidemic similar to this one? Well, that the last one is certainly easy to answer, mm-hmm. I think. I, I think we would be foolish to think that mm-hmm. this will be the last pandemic that any of us experience. Uh, I think that would be um, incredibly nearsighted. My, my wife's grandfather just passed away at 104 years of age. This was his second incredible pandemic. He was mm-hmm. a, a young uh, toddler during the, the Spanish influenza of 1918 and, and then experienced COVID-19. Those are the ones that bookended, but we have so many other influenza pandemics that punctuated life during that time, and not the least of which was 2009, when we had the H1N1 pandemic. So even in my lifetime, I've experienced uh, at least two bona fide pandemics um, where it really disrupted our activities. I I think we should expect that those are going to happen. Mm -hmm. If for no other reason than we are incredibly uh, more gifted in our surveillance now than we were Mm -hmm. 100 years ago, so we're going to see them when they happen. But there are also a number of other uh, factors that that push into that, whether those are geopolitical or climate related. All of that works together to provide opportunities for viruses to emerge as pandemics. Mm -hmm. Um, With that being said, I think we now have an opportunity Uh, to learn from what we did well during this pandemic, Mm -hmm. to really talk transparently and openly about what we could have done better, especially in those first sort of, uh, you know, those early steps. Could we have done something better? Could we have said something better? Could we have articulated the science better? Um, All of that working together, we've got to be prepared now for the next spot, the next pandemic hotspot, but also our response even in those non-pandemic settings. I think we now live in such a global economy, a global uh, effort to be able to constrain these that I think there's a lot we can do from Nashville, whether an individual virus has reached our city or not. And, and Vanderbilt stands really well prepared to do that. Right. Bill, what, what are some of those things that you might think about doing differently next time or that we could do here from Nashville? Well, I think for sure that sustained, clear, science-based communication is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would have preferred 
the communication, as has been the case in previous pandemics and outbreaks of viral diseases, Zika, West, West Nile virus, mm -hmm. Ebola, to have those public health messages come from the CDC rather than from Washington. In Washington, it always has a political cast. Mm -hmm. I think uh, reinforcing the role of the CDC as the main communications mechanism and then having our political leaders support that, but having the point be at the CDC. And I would have preferred us to have a national response rather than a subcontracting it to the, say, to the states which resulted in kind of a crazy quilt of responses across the country. So uh, national response, clear, sustained science-based communication. Consuelo, I'm sure you have opinions too about how things could have been handled better, especially with regards to communication, um, especially and especially to historically marginalized communities. Do you have thoughts you wanna share about that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I have a long list of things that could have been, I think could have been done differently or, or better, specifically though around communication. I think uh, the pandemic highlighted the fact that um, trust and trusted uh, communicators, people within communities uh, are going to be looked to to provide that information. So, um, and also the sources of information, how people consume information in their communities. Um, there, there's a lot of variability there. So we, we really needed to engage trusted community organizations, community leaders very early in this process around, you know, uh, just the framing in general that this is new, the information is going to be evolving and changing. And that doesn't mean that what you heard last time was wrong, but you know, this is, these are the sources that you can go to for trusted information. And it really needed to be um, delivered within communities, um, who, people who are not going to be watching the national news, who are not going to be reading the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, where do people consume information? How do they consume it? We, we needed to do a much better job uh, with that and, and recognizing the, the lack of trust in, um, in, in research due to historical research abuses, um, the differences in trust in, within um, government, like all of those things needed to be considered in how we message the populations that were, were we, we should have predicted early on would be disproportionately impacted. Do you have hope at this point that we can do better next time? And you know, are we taking the steps we need to to be in a better position? I do have hope. I, I have to have hope to stay in my job. I think it's it's really critical. I, I think um, a, a number of people have sort of put out some strategies that we, in, including you know, groups that I'm a part of, uh, strategies for pandemic preparedness. Mm -hmm. Um, that that's more equitable. And I really hope that there'll be some uptake of those. I mean, we, we really have to talk about the data, making sure the data is captured in a way that we can disaggregate it by race, ethnicity, language, socioeconomic status. Um, we, we need to consider the, the other needs of people who are marginalized, who are living in high density homes um, and can't really isolate in their home. So what do they do yeah. when they get when they get infected and they can't leave and they also can't stop working. So they may be reluctant to get tested. So like there are lots of things that we have to anticipate in the infrastructure and the resources. I mean, you know, Vanderbilt and many other institutions sent their students home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, why weren't we using like in some other countries, why weren't we, we using dorms and, and student yes. housing mm -hmm. as places for isolation uh, for people who really needed to protect their families? Like there were so many things that we could do differently uh, mm -hmm. if we really start to map that out now. Yeah. Buddy, I see you nodding. What would you like to add to that? What else do we need to be doing now? Well, it's just such great wisdom from Consuelo because mm -hmm. um, there's this sense in which when we're in the midst of a pandemic and we're all working at DEFCON 2, mm -hmm. that's not the time 
to be creative with our responses. I mean, it is, let's not be, I don't, I don't want to be yeah. so short-sighted there. We have to be creative at all times, but we work better as humans when we have a plan that at least mm-hmm. serves as a template or a default that we can then adapt to in the midst of the actual crisis. Mm-hmm. Crisis decision-making is really challenging no mm-hmm. matter how good we are. So. I wonder if there are some things, whether those are tabletop exercises, whether that's a Monday morning quarterback sort of situation, we could, we could call it any number of things, but I think the inter-pandemic period that we hope to get to soon would give us the mental space to be able to plan for the next one and say, let's think creatively about how we communicate, how we protect, how we prevent what do vaccination strategies need to look like? What do housing for infected individuals look like? What mm-hmm. infrastructural either changes or new initiatives do we need to make right. to be able to be well prepared for that? And so I don't want to send the message that we were ill-prepared or completely unprepared. We, we knew these would happen. And, and mm-hmm. I think by and large, we've, we've done a really nice job, but there's a lot we could do better. Uh, and some of that is going to be, what do we do in the next five years to be ready for the next pandemic? Yeah. If I could just add to that, while we're um, completely agree with Buddy, if we're but while we're doing that, we need to elevate these strategies that were employed by you know community organizations, community leaders that were really under the radar. You mm-hmm. know, uh, we were working with community organizations locally, and and as they were uh, put you know putting together food baskets. Uh, for people who, you know, were now working from home or didn't have a job because of the economy, the gig economy and their, you know, whatever jobs they had, they were, they didn't have. We put masks in with the food Mm -hmm. and that's how we actually distributed the masks. Uh, So, you know, expecting that people are going to go and purchase or find, like that's a strategy Mm -hmm. that also went along with messaging. You know, there was messaging in different languages that that was employed and and how we actually reach different people. So so many great things happen um, in response to the the pandemic that that we haven't fully captured and and need to and bring that into the solutions as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're talking about sort of equity, access to vaccines and boosters. I mean, how are we doing now? I feel like we're kind of entrenched at our current rates of vaccination. New take-ups of, of starting a course of vaccination are really at quite low levels. Is there any room left to do better there? Well, I think there's plenty of room to do mm-hmm. better. Um, we we still are having you know low vaccine uptake in many populations and communities. Mm -hmm. If you look at some of the recent CDC maps where we're looking at social vulnerability indices. Mm -hmm. So in communities that have high social vulnerability and that's, you know, four parts based on race, ethnicity and language, housing, transportation, household composition, socioeconomic status. These communities that have high social vulnerability Mm -hmm. are are still less likely to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, have we given up in some of these communities? Uh, I think in in some ways we have um, accepted the low vaccination rates um, and and we probably need to to rethink that. Mm -hmm. Um, And during the Omicron surge, we certainly saw some increase in vaccination among some communities, but that's not been sustained. Uh, I think you know something that that Buddy mentioned earlier is a key piece of messaging that we probably need to start embedding into the next round of you know mm-hmm. getting people ready. I try not to say vaccine hesitant um, and, and really think about vaccine readiness. Are people mm-hmm. really ready? Do they have access? Um, and you know what are the barriers? But hearing uh, Buddy say. You know, the the original vaccines are still great. And like, mm-hmm. you know, some of that needs to that message needs to go out. People are, oh well, you know, if you got your vaccine a year ago and now is this one even going to work? People have gotten mm-hmm. boosted. Uh, is it too late for me? Why do I need it now? I think we need a fresh round of messaging uh, mm-hmm. around why people um, should and uh, and for those people who said, you know, the vaccine just came out, so it's not safe, and uh, I'm waiting. Well, now you're more than a year into it, and 
you know, we're still around. We don't have extra appendages, you know, haven't, you know, <laughs> grown another eye. So, you know, <laughs> it's safe. <laughs> Why don't we go ahead? And well, in start, fact, start. it's really been two years, right? Since we started the vaccine trials. Yeah, buddy, buddy's nodding. So, it's well, I'm nodding yeah. because this gets, it's something I'm really trying to get my head around and our, our mm-hmm. social scientists and our communication experts and our psychologists mm-hmm. know this far better than I which is to say that most people want to think of themselves as good decision makers and a strategy that I come to the table with that says, yeah, you totally missed that one. You're a terrible parent or you're a terrible decision maker. That's probably going to fail. But if I can come and say, Hey, here's some new information that you did not have access to when you made your decision previously Mm -hmm. that I can now give you, it gives people an out to potentially change their minds. And I think this is a really important communication strategy as we've moved forward is if we can communicate that these are new findings and we have new information to give you, maybe that's enough to, to start to get a little bit of, a, of an excitement around vaccinating those who haven't yet done that. And I, I think the uh, psychologists have also told us that information is absolutely critical and fundamental but it's often not sufficient to change people's minds. Mm-hmm. You have to change what they call their attitude. Mm-hmm. How do they feel about it? And in addition to providing good information, we need to get people to feel comfortable and reassured. And it's the socially appropriate thing to do. So the, as they look left and right amongst their friends, they see them also accepting vaccine. So. Mm-hmm. Getting people into their comfort zone, I think, is important. And you know, we in medicine are so fact and information oriented, mm-hmm. sometimes we don't pay quite as much attention to that. And that's why, as Consuelo was saying earlier, getting people who look like the folks we're trying to reach, who are thought leaders, who are trusted yeah. to carry the messages, helps a lot with that comfort and reassurance. Yeah. I can tell you, I, I can, I'm only sure that I convinced one person to be vaccinated who wouldn't have otherwise. And I know I did it by describing how happy I was and relieved to feel better about spending time with friends and family. Um, I think that was what resonated with that person. Um, so let's see, there's so many different directions we can go. This, this issue of information is really a tough one. I mean, sometimes the CDC guidelines are very detailed and you know, different parts of the country have different rules as they should given the, the risk of infection elsewhere. You know, if you're just a member of the community watching this and you want to get good information, um, Bill, where would you send people? Would you send them to the CDC or are there other places? Well, I think there are now any number of good places you can go for information. The CDC continues to be very good. The National Foundation for Infectious Diseases, Mm -hmm. the American Academy of Pediatrics. And when it comes to children, I say time and time again, speak to your pediatrician, your family doctor. Mm -hmm. They're there for you and your children day in and day out. They can be trusted have that conversation with the person who cares for you. And I think that works for adults also. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's, let's switch gears a little bit here and think about the international angle. How are we doing on access to vaccines, boosters, treatments on an international level? And, and how will that affect all of us um, here in the United States? Buddy, do you want to take start with that one? I can I can start there, and then mm-hmm. and then we can expand. Um, you know, one of the interesting things that we hear a lot about from those who aren't yet ready for vaccination is that it's it's too new and not enough people have gotten it. Mm-hmm. Well, let's be clear: billions with a B have been vaccinated around the world. I don't know that we can say the vaccine is new when billions of people have been vaccinated. So that's maybe the first comment is that we have done a reasonable job getting to most continents. Where Mm -hmm. we are doing very poorly is in the African continent. Um, We have not vaccinated widely. And if you look at any distribution map, it's, it's really a sore spot outside of 
some of the major centers in South Africa and a few places in, in Northern Africa. Um, the second place that we've done very poorly is in some of our other low and middle income countries in South America and throughout Asia and in, in Eastern Europe. Um, mm -hmm. Those areas have been under vaccinated or we don't have quite the same level of data. What's been interesting during this pandemic though is that across the Asian uh, continent in India um, and in some of the areas of Central America, there mm -hmm. have been homegrown vaccines that aren't the Modernas and the Pfizer's and the J&J's that we think of, but they are other manufacturers mm -hmm. that are able to make vaccines a bit cheaper, um, maybe using a different technology. And they may not be quite as effective, but they still do a very good job at preventing severe disease and death in the majority of individuals. Mm -hmm. So it's been interesting. We've done some things really well. We've allowed or provided opportunities for a number of manufacturers to be able to create vaccines that are local and that are maybe easier and cheaper to make. And yet we haven't done a good job in some other ways, like making some of these technologies available to uh, the entire world. And, and this is where I think there's some movement. Uh, but I think the challenge in this pandemic will be when we have an entire continent that is woefully under vaccinated, we're going to continue to see variants emerge. We're going to continue to see spikes of disease. Um, and yes, it'll be blunted because of our own natural immunity and our own from, from vaccination or from wild type infection. But we're going to, have to be very careful about getting the rest of the world vaccinated against this potentially very severe infection. Mm -hmm. Zula, what do you want to add about how these international trends sort of reflect how we're doing within our borders in terms of equity and access? Well, I, I'll just add maybe one thing to the international response. And mm -hmm. I think Adi, you know, summed that up greatly there. Um, still within some countries that have high vaccination rates, mm -hmm. um, those communities, those individuals who are most marginalized, impoverished, um, are, are still suffering with lack of access. Even in, in countries that have, you know, healthcare for all, there, there still are some of those um, mm -hmm. disparities. And so um, they're, they're not completely protected from those socioeconomic challenges. Um, I think within, you know, the United States, we, w again, data, 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 we need better data um, is, is one issue. Um, the, the way that we're considering uh, some of the messaging around make decision making, though, I think still is flawed. So if we say, contact your primary care doctor or contact your pediatrician um, to talk about masking or talk about vaccination or how to protect yourself, we have to recognize that you know, 20 to 25 percent of people don't have a primary mm -hmm. care doctor. Mm -hmm. And that's likely to be people who are you know, socially disadvantaged, or, you know, with lower socioeconomic status. Um, individuals who speak languages or prefer languages other than English are falling into those categories. So mm -hmm. we, we still need better infrastructure um, within our health systems, within the safety net systems to provide information, um, to encourage vaccination, to protections in, in all different kinds of ways. We, we really still need to, to work on that. And until we actually shift our thinking away from, um, you know, what's going to work for the majority and start to think still about who's going to be left out with mm -hmm. these decisions, um, then I, I think we're gonna continue to have these pockets of inequities and, and wonder why we're not able to get through. Yeah, so what we really need is medicine and public health. Of course, we've known for a while, but we've never been really great at executing, right? I mean, do, can you think, Consuelo, of any places where there has been um, uh, model or, or excellent um, examples of um, medicine and public health working together during this pandemic to increase access and equity? Um, I think that, uh, well, I, I guess it bl the lines are blurred in, yeah. in some ways <laughs> um, there, but a, a lot of uh, healthcare professionals who also might consider themselves to be public health practitioners are sort of walking that fine line. And you can mm -hmm. see, you know, some strategies like in Philadelphia 
and um, in Los Angeles in particular, some um, uh, really great partnerships in um, communicating and where they're setting up, you know, um, mobile pop-up testing as well as pop-up vaccinations in New York City. Um, I think there've been some great partnerships there. And then of course here in Nashville, um, Meharry Medical College yes. um, partnered really closely with um, Davidson County Health Department, Metro Health Department in the, the testing and um, extending that to churches and community organizations. Uh, so, so some really you know, great opportunities for us to embed those lessons learned into future pandemic preparedness. I think we definitely want to take advantage of that. Uh, we, we still haven't done the best job of data sharing. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think you know, with all of the informatics tools and resources we have, that is also something that we should be working on. You know, how will we share data and information um, more rapidly, seamlessly, um, in order to support the entire um, health, public health um, system? Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I think better data to inform targeted interventions, reach populations and the like will be very, very important. Um, let me switch gears a little bit um, and take the opportunity to ask uh, Dr. Creech, what, what cutting edge treatments might be on the horizon um, and, uh, and what could their effect be on the trajectory of this pandemic or even endemic situation? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we've got four categories of preventive agents or therapies that, that we think about. The first are, are vaccines. We've talked about that a good bit. The second is for those who haven't been able to mount that immune response we need. So particularly the immunocompromised. And for those, we have a number of monoclonal antibodies. So these are antibodies that are recovered from people who have successfully navigated the infection. We then synthesize and make a truckload of them. And then we can infuse those with varying levels of success, depending on where we are in the pandemic, what variant is emerging. And in those, the original monoclonals aren't as good sometimes because the virus evades them. But that's the second big category that I think we have now learned may provide a new uh, era of monoclonal antibody treatment and prevention of infectious diseases that sometimes are faster to develop than vaccines. The third category would be the drugs that we can use that are directly fighting the virus. We were part of those trials doing remdesivir here at Vanderbilt, and then in the Denison Laboratory, molnupiravir, which is being um, marketed by Merck. That's a drug that interferes with the ability of the virus to lay down that genetic sequence in copies of itself. Mm -hmm. And then Pfizer has a drug that's called Paxlovid that's easier to pronounce than the two component drugs mm -hmm. of the drug. Um, so forgive me for using the trade name there. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the advantage of molnupiravir and Paxlovid is they're both orally available. So mm -hmm. think about them like Tamiflu for yes. the virus. Um, they have varying success. Right now, the biggest problem is just getting access to them uh, because they've been, at least to this yeah. point, a little more challenging to get. And then the fourth category are those drugs that aren't necessarily preventing the infection, aren't necessarily treating it immunologically. They're not fighting the virus directly, but what they're doing is basically telling our immune system just to calm down a little bit. And whether that's a blunt tool like steroids or whether mm -hmm. that's a repurposing of drugs that we might use for rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis, mm -hmm. I think this pandemic has allowed us, um, if we look at a silver lining, uh, it's allowed our rheumatologists, our immunologists, our infectious disease folks to come together and say infections are so much more than just the pathogen and, and yes. maybe mm -hmm. a part of me. It's really my response mm -hmm. to the infection as well. So it's not unlike this idea that when there's a fire and we put out that fire, yes, we did a good job getting rid of the fire, but there's still smoke damage and there's still water damage from us putting out the fire. What we're learning now is the sooner we can begin some of those immune modifying therapies, the better off we'll be from some of those downstream complications that we might see. I, I mentioned that because I think that's the real cutting edge okay. going forward is to say that sometimes the biggest thing we can do is kill the virus. Sometimes the biggest thing we can do is tell the immune system to calm down. Real quick anecdote, when, when I was mm -hmm. sick in March of 20 with my family, 
I remember at about day 10 or 12 saying, if I took steroids, Mm -hmm. I know that I would be better. But we didn't have those data back then. So I didn't take any steroids. But Mm -hmm. just physiologically, I knew that there was a sort of a hyper inflammation occurring. Mm -hmm. Once we began to use steroids, we started to see better outcomes in those individuals who are sick enough to be in the hospital, but not sick enough to be in the ICU. That helps us moving forward with other infections as well. So that's the real, I think that's the real cutting edge here is how can we modify the immune system even more precisely? And how can we treat these infections even earlier than we might because of telling the immune response to calm down? Yeah. Well, I know, you know, we've all been vaccinated and boosted and now we can hear about these cutting edge treatments. And so I'm wondering if I can get a little personal, how we, how we're thinking about our own trajectories. Um, And if I could ask Bill, are you planning any international travel? What are you looking forward to? And what do you think we should all be watching as we make those personal decisions for ourselves and our families? Well, Linda, I think the decisions are very, very personal. Mm -hmm. There are people who are young and healthy and exuberant and are ready to get out and about. I have friends and colleagues uh, Mm -hmm. of the whole spectrum of ages uh, that have been on airplanes. There are others of us, and uh, here I'm going to be a little bit personal. Mm -hmm. We have a an extended family member who's actually now living with us who has a very serious underlying illness. Mm -hmm. And if they were to become infected, they would get seriously ill. So we're in our little family enclave still being very, very conservative. We're wearing the masks. We haven't gone out to the restaurants yet. So I think we'll see a whole spectrum out there of folks who are ready to go out and others who, because of their particular circumstances, their frailty, their immunosuppression, uh, I think are going to be a little bit more careful. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting back to some inter, uh, national, not international, but national professional meetings yes. and seeing friends and colleagues. I'm really looking forward to that. But that's still a few months down the road, at least for me. Mm-hmm. What about you, Betty? Well, Boy, I may be on the other end of this. My uh, my daughter is a junior at Vanderbilt. She's studying abroad in Paris this semester. Um, she's living her best life now, um, making the most of pandemic challenges, but still able to you know move freely about the continent. Um, in part because she's vaccinated fully. She was boosted. She has a history of disease. There may not be anyone on the planet more reasonably protected (laughs) than her. And oh, by the way, she's part of a risk group that's very low for complication. Um, Meanwhile, my family, we're going to visit her for spring break in two weeks. um, And it'll be my first international travel since the pandemic began. But we're doing it under cloak of vaccine protection. And so I think one of the messages that that we need to be shouting from the rooftop. If we are to understand that freedom and purity are often two of the moral foundations that those who aren't vaccine ready tend to lean on in their decision-making, well, I want that freedom to be able to go visit my daughter in Paris. Uh, I want the freedom to go to national meetings. The way I access that freedom is by being vaccinated because then I'm protected individually and I'm caring for those around me in a similar fashion. So um, thankfully, um, even though I had uh, a significant illness with COVID, um, I am banking on my immune system properly vaccinated and boosted to carry me through should I be, uh, should I be exposed. Bill, do you want to chime in on this one? Sure. <laughs> I, I, I would, I'm hoping that uh, our daughter, who is a freshman in college this year, is is hoping to study abroad this summer. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that I'll get to visit her in Italy um, when she goes. But right now we are still being very cautious as well. Unfortunately, we had several family members who died from COVID. And, um, you know, that just has, has, you know, had a devastating effect on on our family and, and the level of caution that we, um, exercise and, and continue, and you know, the, with the you know new CDC guidelines coming out Friday, the you know the the family Zoom calls to go over you know how you find your county on the map and the in the system to see what the level is, and even if it's low, do you still are you still ready to 
you know, not wear your mask. Like we're, we're still in that, you know, very cautious um, stage and probably will be. Um, I do intend to travel um, hopefully in the beginning of April as in getting inducted into American Society of Clinical Investigation. So I, I do hope to attend that in person, you know, double mask on the plane probably at that point. So Melinda, can I jump in and just say, you know, this highlights something really interesting is that we, we're all going to have to have a lot of grace with each other yeah. because we all come from different risk backgrounds. We mm -hmm. come from different risk tolerance backgrounds. Mm -hmm. We yeah. all have different needs and experiences. And I think that's one of the most important things we could say going forward is that mm -hmm. whether one feels a little bit more freedom where someone else still feels um, like they don't. I think we just need a whole lot of grace with, un, with one another to say both of those are equally valid mm -hmm. and we need to celebrate that rather than let that be a dividing line of um, some proxy for whatever it might be. Um, I think we do well to say, awesome, let's embrace both of those. I completely agree. And since it's only fair that I answer my own question um, and then I'm gonna give you, you the chance to ask each other questions. Um, I would say first that I did go to my first professional meeting in, in two years, um, just a, two weeks ago. And it was wonderful, Bill, to see those colleagues in person and have those conversations. It was fantastic and, and energizing and all the things that I hoped it would be. And so I dearly hope that that can continue. Um, and then I also have uh, booked a trip for my family um, uh, to Africa for the pretty distant future. And yet I really hope that in that distant future, we will all be able to have an amazing family experience together in a part of the world um, that is, as you've pointed out already, still not well vaccinated. So, okay, so I just promised we could, we could turn the tables. I want to call on you first, buddy, and say, what question do you have for another member of the panel? This is kind of fun. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's do this. All right. Um, this could get really dangerous very quickly. Um, you know, I'm going to ask Bill something because um, Bill has to be one of the most gifted communicators that we have in Nashville. Um, so I'm going to brag about you before I really put you on the hot seat here. Um, oh, Many of us in medicine don't do a good job of communicating. In fact, we're sort of horrible at it. Um, we either don't describe the data in a compelling way, or we don't approach the attitude, as you mentioned. What do you think coming out of this pandemic, what, what impact do you think this will have on either medical education or the need for more formal training and communications and, and delivery of information. Do you see there being a, a, a shift here? Well, you know, uh, I also share your hope. You mentioned hope earlier in this conversation, but I'm not so certain that we're very good in America at after action reports and learning our lessons. You know, we have pretty short attention spans and America from its beginnings has looked to the future. Uh, rather than the past. So, I, but I would hope that uh, whether in formal circumstances, such as medical schools that we're part of, mm -hmm. and also in professional societies, we pay more attention to communication, to listening, and to developing uh, techniques so that we can really reach our patients uh, better. I, I, I think it's very important. One of the constraints is time. Better communication takes a little more time. And people feel very constrained in their doctor-patient relationships today because they're often under a certain amount of time pressure. Uh, that will take longer to work out. And that uh, has to do with uh, health policy, Melinda, so that we can allow the average time that we have with our patients to extend a bit more than we have in the past. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. National surveys show that primary care physicians are spending about the same time with every patient as they have for decades. But I think there's just a lot more information to cram into those periods of time, 15 minute intervals, 20 minute intervals. And so it just feels different. So Bill, who do you wanna ask a question of? Well, I think I'd like to uh, not so much ask a question, but uh, be on the same wavelength as 
as Consuela. And it's interesting that uh, Buddy asked me about communications and mm -hmm. such, and I was thinking about the same thing. She, the geriatr geriatrician in this group, mm -hmm. I, the internist. You know, each year um, against influenza, we vaccinate two thirds of the population of the United States uh, against influenza. Mm -hmm. That is an enormous accomplishment, but it leaves fully one third of that population unvaccinated. We have to reach out to them in, in, a, in a better way. And uh, I'm, I'm sure she would agree and perhaps has some thoughts about how we can do a better job doing that. After all, when it comes to flu vaccine, as with COVID vaccine, you just have to roll up your sleeve. You don't have to reach for your wallet. It's free, right? And it doesn't take very long. And it really does offer a substantial measure of protection against these viral intruders that we're trying to have a truce with. So Consuela, uh, yeah. harmonize me here a little bit. Well, you know, I, I, I just uh, went with my mother to, um, to her primary care visit last week. And I say carefully went with her because she's a very active um, uh, woman and I will not say her age <laughs> and, because I'll get in trouble. And I will not say that I took her because she will be clear to say that she can take herself. Uh, but, you know, on the, on the door and at Vanderbilt um, in, the, in the primary care office, on the back door, it, there's a sign that talks about flu and it's tell, saying, at, encouraging people to get their flu shot. Mm -hmm. and, and at the end of it, it says, the flu shot will not give you the flu. And that's like the first thing that she says to me, um, she's like, I don't want to get the flu, so I'm not going to take the flu shot. And so there's all this, you know, misinformation that I think still belies, you know, some of the decisions that people um, make. And, um, and, and I think that we still have a long way to go in effectively communicating, you know, which I think we really did a great job around, you know, the, the mRNA vaccines. Mm -hmm. like, you know, this is your immune response. This is what's happening. This is not you becoming ill. And so I think there, we, we need to have more education and information there. Um, unfortunately, though, still in, in many communities, uh, the idea of an injection inoculating someone with something is giving them something. Um, and that dates back to the historical research abuses uh, that people, communities have experienced. And so that still, there's a, still a lot of distrust, mistrust uh, there. And we as healthcare professionals and healthcare organizations, health organizations, have to actually earn that trust. We need to be more trustworthy if we're going to deliver that message. Well put. All right, your turn, Consuelo. Oh, well, great. I get to ask Buddy a question. So, uh, and he can't ask me one, right? I hope not. So, <laughs> I don't know. I think we'll probably be out of time. So, uh, the, you know, with all of the decision making that uh, people have had to have, organizations, institutions, uh, schools had to make during the pandemic. Um, what would you what would you advise schools now based on what we've learned um, in preparing for uh, the next pandemic? Oh boy, that's such a loaded question. I love it. Um, but but I think this is important. This is where we try not to make crisis level decisions but we make them now and then adjust them if they're not exactly right for the next crisis. Um, here are some things I think we learned. I think we learned that if your child has access to a computer, a quiet room, high-speed internet, food in their home, and a supportive parent, that you can theoretically do distance learning for a short period of time. Unfortunately, those elements are true of a minority of our population because of all of the things that go into that. And sometimes I worry that we couldn't get all those elements right. Say, sure, let's do distance learning. Who's going to stay home with the child? Oh, wait, someone has to stay home and not go to work. Well, that's fine. They can just take some days off. Really? They can? Um, because that probably impacts their income, which then, in, uh, anyway, it's complicated. I think we also learned that when we have risk mitigation efforts in effect, barring Omicron coming through like the viral bull in a China shop, 
we can actually see decreased transmission of viruses in those school systems. And we can actually provide an environment where these viruses don't run rampant. So I think we learned two things. Um, we learned that um, some of the efforts that we initially jumped into they just don't work for the majority of people. And, and we need to be mindful of that. And it disproportionately affects, ironically, those who are already disproportionately affected by the pandemic. Yeah. Second thing we learned is that we need to be really agile. Um, is it true that we do a poorer job reading emotions from faces that are partially covered with a mask? Sure. Does it have long-term psychological impact? No. Um, can we do these things during periods of viral surges and then release those when transmission is low? Yeah, I think we can. And I think we now have a model rather than shutting down a school system for one week, two weeks when there's a flu outbreak or strep throat or COVID that we can put into place some really minimal and reasonable risk mitigation strategies, putting kids further away, putting masks on, um, being able to limit those times where they're actively spreading virus to one another, that they may work not just for COVID, but for other viruses as well. Uh, I think we underestimated um, the need for food security in a lot of our neighborhoods. Uh, by shutting down schools, we ran the risk of shutting down access to, um, to, to predictable uh, meals. Um, we're going to have some, some at least short-term, if not middle-term effects in, in lost learning. So um, what would I say? I, I think everybody did the best they could with the knowledge mm -hmm. they had. And we better learn from it because I think there are some things that going forward, we should absolutely repeat masking during times of high viral transmission. And there are some things that we probably don't need to uh, do again because they weren't as effective and they had downstream consequences that we could have predicted, but we didn't. So when I talk about pandemic preparedness, I don't simply mean let's build out mRNA technologies or other things so that we can have a vaccine ready. I don't just mean let's build our hospitals in a strategic way so that we can have periods of surges so it doesn't tax our system. I don't just mean training individuals who can care for those, those patients. Mm -hmm. I also mean infrastructural community-based preparedness to say when one of these, I love the way Bill said it, when one of these viral intruders gets past our first and second lines of defense, how are we going to make sure that we don't add to the confusion to the chaos and the disruption by doing things that we actually think are helpful that turn out to be miscalculations. That's a terrible answer, Consuelo, but it's the best I can do. Oh, Great I answer. That, I, yeah, love I it. found it really hopeful, um, yeah. thoughtful and hopeful. Um, yeah. So, you know, I wish actually we could go on longer, um, but I think that's a great place to end our time together um, on that note of, of what we've learned and what we can do to make it better, especially for kids going forward. Um, so I want to thank everyone who joined us for this webinar today. I hope you found this conversation helpful in understanding what the future of COVID-19 might look like. And I want to thank um, our three Three panelists for joining us. It was a pleasure to speak with you all, and I wish everyone a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you.